Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm happy uh, to be joined by John Giorgio. You might know him from Backgammon Forums. He's a Dice Maverick. He's a controversialist. John Giorgio, thanks for joining me today. <laughs> Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me on your channel, mate. I've watched it grow from fairly humble beginnings to something quite special now. You're doing a really good job. Thank you, John. I, I could say the same for you. Um, I think your game has improved. Um, your understanding on the forums has definitely got better. And maybe you're more willing as well to uh, listen to the, the opinions of others. But, let, but let's see. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to get you on here because you've just come back from Monte Carlo. Um, it was your first time in Monte Carlo, correct? Yeah, it, it was my first international backgammon event, period. Um, I've played almost all the ones in the UK circuit. I've been from Leamington Spa to Newcastle to Bradford to Liverpool to Brighton to Birmingham. You know, I've been all, all over the UK circuit and um, I decided if I'm going to do an international one, may as well make it the big one, you know. So, yeah. It is a big one. It's a world championship. Um, I've met you at UK tournaments. I can account for you being a good guy, John. Um, but how was Monte Carlo? Tell me about your experience um, of being at that big tournament, being at the Fairman's Hotel. Talk about it. How was yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, I think that I would break it up into two parts. So there's Monte Carlo, the place, and then there's the tournament and everything that goes uh, along with that. Um, I'm not very well traveled, so I would say it's uh, quite easy to be a bit awe inspired because it's, I'm not used to seeing the kinds of things that I saw. I'm not used to it. Monte Carlo is like, I don't know if I felt like I'm in a different world. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not the wealthiest of person, but I'll tell you in Monte Carlo, I felt like extremely small in a financial sense. Like the place just oozes opulence and wealth. Sure. You know? The people though, in general, from when I landed in France, I flew into Nice um, and I caught the train to Monaco. I stayed in a hotel on the front side of the city. It's an area called Bule Soleil. Um, I was recommended it by Lawrence Powell, who is a very frequent visitor to the World Championships. Mm -hmm. And um, I tapped him up for some inside information when I was planning my journey. And I got some very helpful advice from him. Great. So everybody I met in France was so friendly, um, accommodating because I like no five French words like I, <laughs> and I think I came back only knowing maybe six French words you know it's like your bog standard au revoir you know mercy for thanks or pardon I was saying pardon a lot like <laughs> <laughs> so um where did you stay how far was it from the the Fairmont and how much how much did it cost Oh, I'm I'm a bit uh, like um, shy to say where I stayed because I don't want it to get overpopulated next year when okay. I go back. <laughs> I don't give everyone these trade secrets, but, <laughs> but I'll say one thing: um, Julian, you know Julian Manuala, he was mm -hmm. there. Um, Akiko was there. Uh, Michael Krakus was there. Wow. Um, Johan, Johan uh, Hoyt, I think his name is, and another Scandinavian player, I forget, I, I forgot his name. Like, there was loads of backgammon players at this hotel, it was, it was amazing, you know. You could have had a fabulous chouette. You know, we, we, we could have, but I think everyone was doing their own thing most of the time. So after the first morning when I bumped into a lot of them at breakfast, I didn't really see them again. But um, like on my last night, I left my phone charger at the venue and I was planning on returning home the next day. 
it's only about a 10, 15 minute walk, but it's downhill going there and it's uphill coming back. Sure. And I was just feeling like I can't do this walk one more time. So I, I messaged Michael and asked him, please, can you bring my charger back with you and you come to the hotel, which of course he did. So it was very convenient staying at a hotel where <laughs> there's other people doing the same thing you do, you know. Sure. How much How much was it? Uh, um, it I was booked in to stay for six nights. Um, I was supposed to check out on Sunday, which was the same day as the final. Um, my thought process was, if I'm still in the tournament on the Sunday, finding somewhere to sleep Sunday night is going to be the least of my worries because <laughs> I've either come first or second. <laughs> so it was a bit of positive thinking going on. Um, BA, however, decided to cancel my return flight um, uh -huh. on the Sunday and they pushed it to Monday. So whether I was not whether I was in the tournament or not, um, finding somewhere to stay on the Sunday night became like a real challenge because I was going to be there one way or the other. Sure. Um, but as things transpired, um, I crossed that bridge earlier than than planned. But yeah, it was the the hotel w worked out about hundred euros a night. Okay. Um, which is very reasonable. It was, you know, it was a comfortable adequate room it had one of those lovely showers with the big like i don't know like big water droplet top bit <laughs> and like a hard hard uh, <laughs> steam thrusting one in the yeah it was, it was like a good shower shower yeah, yeah where a good shower is always welcome uh, i i love that shower i'd stay <laughs> there again just for the shower <laughs> Okay, so Monte Carlo doesn't need to be a, a mega expensive um, trip. I know the, the the tournament was itself a thousand euros, right, to enter the, the open, That's um, right. which which is quite high. But again, the the prize fund is is, is massive, um, and now we know that Sander uh, has won um, this afternoon over over ZZ. Uh, right. Very, very entertaining uh, to watch um, both that final and the previous one against Will Snellings, which was um, one of the best matches ever streamed. So, so huge thanks to Galaxy. I, I, I've watched both of those and I would say the one with Will, because it went more down to the wire, yeah. I thought it was actually a little bit more enjoyable. Um, I've met ZZ in person when I went to Monaco and I've met him before online. Um, so I was actually rooting for ZZ because um, like I consider him a friend, you know, so yeah. I was rooting for him and he just, he just didn't seem to be able to get any traction today. Sander was playing very well and getting some good roles at the right time, which makes the difference, you know? So Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm sure even Zizi is probably a bit disappointed that it couldn't have been a closer run affair today. Yeah, I think it's remarkable how the final, uh, the main final, uh, Sander and Zizi was was the same as uh, the UBC final that we saw some months back, which was also Sander and Zizi. Um, okay. So, you know, remarkable, you know, ZZ, obviously, you know, a young player, incredibly gifted, a backgammon. And Sander is like, I think Mark Olson refers to him as like this kind of chaos. Um, you know, he's kind of in some ways untaught, um, unorthodox, but he yeah. just has this kind of intuition and feeling for the game. A kind of a maverick player. Like, yeah, but but just fascinating. But you know, if he's if he's untaught, then it's really special the way he plays because he plays like guys who studied a lot. Whereas for him, it's probably coming more from his intuition than from a lot of study of position. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I, when I had Mark on the channel, Mark Olson, just recently, um, he spoke about Sander and he said he's never met anyone with such a feel for the game um, and 
I'm interested really in the the balance between feeling and study. Tell me, John, where do you see yourself? Are you more a, a feeling player or more a studying player? I'm I'm definitely a feeling player. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I. I don't um, always agree with XG, which everyone else defers to as the 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 Bible of how to play, so to <laughs> speak. Um, I, I think that it's right a lot of the time. Don't get me wrong. I just don't always agree with it, you know. So I'm definitely more of a feeling player um, sure. than study. I'd prefer to, I, I don't know Falafel. I never met him, but from what I've heard, he just played thousands and thousands of games and just got really good and learned a lot of intuition about the various positions. And I think I'd, I'd like my journey to carry on that sort of trajectory where you just, you learn whilst you play because le I don't enjoy learning. I enjoy playing. I love playing backgammon. <laughs> so I'd rather play 20 games a day and bit by bit, various uh, gems of information seep their way into my cranium from that. And I get better as a result of practice, basically. Great. We're going to talk more about XG later in this video. But let's speak a bit, bit more about Monte Carlo. Um, sure. yeah. So, I mean, what was it like meeting, you know, your backgammon heroes? I, I saw your photos with all these <laughs> fantastic players and... Uh, I mean, how was that for you? What were they like? What was your impression? Um, that, that's one of the highlights of my journey was uh, meeting these people face to face. Um, <laughs> it's a bit funny, but I'd introduce myself. I'd be like, hi, uh, my name's John Giorgio. And they'd go like, oh, you're him. Or something, <laughs> something to that effect. Because... Um, I think online on the forums and stuff, I've been um, a bit opinionated, maybe a bit combative sometimes. And um, I've probably rubbed people the wrong way who haven't met me in real life, so to speak. So I think there's a bit of that. I wouldn't class it as a positive thing, but there was a bit of that reputation preceded me. So it, it was nice to meet these respected good players to meet them on a hu human level you know yeah. um i'd met zz mochi michi chris trench i'd met them all before on little videos i do online sure. and um, they were all in attendance so it was really nice to get to meet them in person um another friend of mine that i'd made on facebook was ray lightburn he's a he's kind of, we're a little bit kindred spirits on the whole dice discussion um so he was there i met him in person so you know it was really nice nick blazer who you've had on your channel recently yeah. he's a lovely man very good commentator um Amazing, I, did, yeah. I did mix up john o'hagan and full simberg <laughs> i thought <laughs> they both wear glasses so yeah. uh, they're, they're both old american gentlemen so <laughs> i went up to john and said oh full hi can i have a photo it's like i'm not full that's full i was like <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that was a little bit embarrassing but you, you know i only seen them from like their facebook profile it's not i haven't been like stalking all these players waiting to meet no, them and monitor <laughs> um, did you pick up any advice from any of these great players? Any well, Bill Riles, who's a great American player. Yeah, good he, commentator. He was part of the commentating and streaming team. And he's a lovely man. And um, I bumped into him a few times and we'd have little short conversations because he was obviously busy. But he told me this one anecdote from another friend of his, I think's passed away. But he, it was about dice and how, as players, we shouldn't blame the dice when they, like, don't help us. We should look at it from the perspective of it's our job to help the dice by using them as best we can. Mm -hmm. So it's like, help the dice to help us. <laughs> and... Um, 
as someone who's had a lot of dice conversations, I really like thought, yeah, I like I like that. It's it's a good way of looking at it, you know. Absolutely. How how were the dice? I have to ask you, John. How were your dice in Monte Carlo? Ah, uh, uh, not <laughs> not the greatest. Um, I I recorded all my matches, which is part of something I'm doing on a personal level as I look to improve my game. Okay. Instead of coming back from tournaments or matches crying, oh, I was unlucky. How many times can you say you're unlucky? It's time to maybe look at your game and see where are you going wrong? Are there things that you could improve on? And so to that effect, I've started recording my matches. So I took, <laughs> I took like my stand, my laptop, like I took this whole bunch of equipment all the way to Monaco with me so that I could record my matches. And um, I did. Um, I, transcribing them was quite painful. Um, but yes, I, except for my final match, where I was in a match-winning situation, probably 90% to win the match, and my opponent managed to turn around that game and then win the DMP game after that. Um, but I would say that was probably the only part where I would say I was a bit unlucky because if you're 90% favorite to win something, that's pretty strong odds. And yeah. I didn't get over the line. So besides that, I'm, I'm not bothered. It was, I'm very happy I went. It's, um, it's made me better as a person. It's going to improve my backgammon because I've recorded those matches. I'm actually going through them with a very good UK player. Um, I don't know if you'll mind me mentioning his name, but Reese is going through all the matches with me. Um, we've already we've already been through one of them. He's identified like some style of mine that I need to tone back because it's uh, leading me into difficulties in in the games so yeah i'm just i'm looking forward to the future i'm looking forward to my next tournament um i'm not sure if it's going to be the midlands open or the uk open but whichever one of those two is next then um, that's where i'm looking forward to next seems year. like you're doing all the right things there john obviously reese hodges a superb young player um world youth champion Apparently. Yeah, absolutely. Well mentioned. Um, so he's looking through and, you know, every every GM I've had on the channel, whether it's Dirk Schumann, Zedek Ziska, Mark Olson, they all talk about analysis, database, finding the, the common threads where you're making mistakes. And sometimes as an improving player, it's hard to identify even where you're going wrong. You can't see the wood through the trees, right? Yes. So listing, you know, a stronger player to help find those patterns. It, it sounds like you're you're doing all the right things, John. Yeah. It's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. No, because I, I do, I love the game and I think I'll enjoy it more the better I get at it. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, that's, that's my journey. And this was just a part of it, you know, going to Monte Carlo. You know, I can tell you another interesting thing. So on Monday, I arrive at the hotel it's been a hell of a day travel. It's really hot in France. And I've been lugging all this luggage around. I walked past the train station up the hill in like midday sun, <laughs> trying to follow Google Maps, then realized, no, it's back there. So at least then I was going downhill, find my way. The train was so cheap. From Nice to Monaco was five euros on the train. I mean, you can't moan at that that's very reasonable isn't that's very it very reasonable yeah so so and i get to the hotel lovely check in have a shower and think right let me take all my stuff to the venue go see everyone pay my entry all that sort of stuff by the time i got back to the hotel it must have been around 10 10 p.m half 10 i couldn't find any like food places that were open around me and yeah, I was quite tired. I didn't want to go walking too far. So I saw this little convenience shop, um, something like in England, like a 24-hour shop, that sort of place. So I got a bag of crisps and a drink from there. And that was my dinner. 
on Monday night. So, you know, food food didn't cost me a lot on the first day. <laughs> I think I was all in for about three quid. Um, but it meant Tuesday morning when I woke up, I hit the continental breakfast buffet at the hotel. Uh, I hit it like a, a man who's not seen food for a while. <laughs> <laughs> ravenous yeah filled yeah. your pockets with bread rolls and crosses. um yeah i think i might have slipped a few pieces of cheese <laughs> in the pocket for later you know this video is going live uh, they might not ask you back john <laughs> <laughs> ah I I, I I i gave them all a bit of a tip when i left just to say thanks for making my stay so enjoyable so i think i'll be all right i think they'll welcome me back and and I mean, would you go again? Would you go next year? To yeah, one hundred percent. I'm going. I'm going next year, definitely, uh, definitely. With what I've learned from this year, with the improvements I'm hoping to make in my game over the next few months, why not? You know, <laughs> why not? Wonderful. So, before we put this video together, John, I was texting you about a little quiz. Um, and I asked you to choose five random numbers, uh, yeah. from one to 501. No, I should have figured it out when you said 501. I should have figured out about <laughs> Bill Roberti's book. But I was so, like, naive. I just randomly selected numbers like I was choosing lottery numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no, no idea what I selected. So, so John chose five random numbers which corresponded to five positions in this excellent book by Bill Roberti. Um, I'll put a link to it in the video description, but it's a fantastic um, asset to improvement, uh, full of positions on primes, opening game, blitzes, everything you can think of, and with a short description at the end by Bill Roberti. Who it's the is one backgammon book I've got. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it means you might have seen them already. Um, I haven't got past the first four pages though. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so John, I'm interested to see what you've learned in Monte Carlo. So I'm going to show you five positions. All right. I'm going to see if you can find the right answer. And then I'm going to see if you can explain why it's the correct answer. As long as you promise not to hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Okay, so this is position six from right. Bill Roberti's 501. Um, so Green has won the opening roll with a 6-5 and ran one back checker, as you can see. Yeah. Um, and now White has a 2-1 to play as an opening reply. So okay. this, I, is, I, I this know... is a money game as well, okay? None of these are from match play. Yeah. Okay, I, I know this one because people have tried to help me with opening rolls. Okay. Um, I look at it a bit like painting by numbers. I like to have flair and pizzazz, not <laughs> do the same thing all the time because I find that boring. So I think the correct play is 13-11 and 24-23, or there's potential for variance to maybe even do 13, 11, 6, 5. Um, I've never spent much time understanding the difference between money or match play because I don't play a lot of money games. I'll play money matches, not money games. So I'm not quite sure how that might change the dynamic of what's the right play or not. But yeah, so if I was trying to play like XG, I would play 13, 11, 24, 23. That's your final decision? Yes. Okay. You picked the second best play. You can see the plus plus analysis on the right hand side. So the correct move is 13, 11, 6 to 5. Right. And then the final position is there on the bottom right. Um, so do you want to have the go explaining why this might be the correct play? Any ideas? Yeah, maybe because it's... Um, do you know if this changes for a, a proper match game as opposed to a money game? Um, at, a, at certain match scores, sure, the slot might not be correct if, if you're, you're quite ahead on the match score. I'd have to 
I'd have to run it on XG. Okay. Um, I think in money game, you can be a bit more extravagant in general because you're just going to lose a few points. You're not going to like lose a match and be knocked out of something. So the 6-5 makes sense because if you are missed, it gives you a good chance to make a solid home board point. Good. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, by playing 13-11, you can now cover the five point with any six, threes, one, or combinations of those, or even an eight from the 13 point. So yeah, you've got a lot of covers. Um, there's not much benefit to playing the 24-22. So once you've decided that 6-5 is your one, uh, by process of elimination, you arrive at 13-11 as your only viable two. Sure. So I can tell you that the, this is a correct play because our opponent has already escaped one checker. So effectively, we're playing a kind of containment game and we want to try to prevent the other checker from, from escaping. Um, so Green is already um, ahead in the race. Um, so by slotting the five point and being run down from the mid, on a subsequent roll, we might make the point, we might make the five point, we might make the bar point, and we might be able to trap that, that loan checker back. Um, and you can see, as you said, sixes, ones, threes, double fours. There's a lot of covering numbers, right? Yeah. Um, also, if Green hits, he's going to be unable to make anything constructive on the other side of the board unless he rolls, you know, a double. Um, so usually when one checker has escaped, it's a good idea to make a slotting play to try to contain um, the other checker. Okay. Right. Ne next position. Right, so this one's a bit trickier. This is position 24. Um, white has a double six to play. So home board for white is in the bottom right. Uh, have a think about it, John. Um, and um, This one feels quite instinctive. Um, I'd make the five point, the seven point, and for my last six, I'll go 24-18 as I try to get some movement going at the back. Fantastic. Correct play. Now, what I liked about your explanation is how you broke down the numbers. And that's exactly what you should do when you get a double. So the first six is obvious, right? 11 to 5. You, that's right. You've got to play that. Then you bring one checker down to the 7, one checker to the 18, and you decide on the last six, right? right. Yeah. So why why is it better to make the the seven point rather than the eighteen? Why why did you make that choice? Um, because if we make the eighteen, we don't have a very nice last six to play, because our choice becomes slotting the seven or slotting the two. Um, I would rather like trap my opponent or contain them by making the seven point because then we've got a four prime then we can look to cube because we've got a much better board structure depending on how our opponent rolls in response to this play so i think just long long term or for the future that's the structure that will give us the most options going forward Absolutely. So the four point prime, as we said, it's very strong. And also, if you look at the bottom right, the final position, we don't really mind being hit on the 18 because mm -hmm. we would have a lot of returns from the bar. Getting hit on the seven point, on the other hand, gives Green much kind of better momentum. Yeah. Um, and um, if we got hit with the six, for example, on the 18, our opponent starting to strip their 13 point. And they they will a few more bad sixes and they they could land up like crunching or just being very open and we we'd have a lot of control going forward in the game. Absolutely. Thinking about the bad rolls is essential. As you can see with the four prime, fives and sixes don't play particularly well for Green, do they? He's gonna end up um, you know with some inflexible kind of decisions to make. 
So well done, John. You got the second one correct. So that's uh, one one. <laughs> Third position. Um, position ninety eight. White to play a six two. Have a think about it. Why did I choose ninety eight? <laughs> ninety nine would have been better. Okay, let's have a look. All right, I've got my play. Um, I've arrived at it just by not liking anything else I can see. Um, so my play is 13-5. In case my opponent tries to run one of their back checkers, I've got more builders in place to attack the one they leave behind. Okay. Let me show you the answer. So, unfortunately, your play um, is a blunder, and the correct play <laughs> is to simply run one checker, 24 to 16. Um, okay. Anything else um, is, is flagged as quite a high error. Um, so, again, you can see with the position of, after the roll. Um, why, why do you think this is correct, John, 24 to 16? Any ideas? Um... Maybe maybe we've got to start getting some movement going from our anchor. We can't stay there, or you know, for the whole game. Uh, maybe it, uh, XG thinks that this is as good a time as any. Um, I can see on the sixteen, if we get hit by a Ford at the cost of our opponent's thirteen point, which is good for us. Um, maybe there's a few return shots if we're hit loose. Uh, also, maybe another one is if we get hit, it's unlikely our opponent can point at us on the same time. So, Okay, so there's a few reasons why this is correct. Firstly, when your opponent has an advanced anchor, you usually want to adv advance your back checkers uh, as well. Here you can see the pip count is very close, right? One, it's identical actually at the moment. By running one checker out, we're duplicating fours and twos, right? Yeah. By doing so, um, because they play well for green to make the four point. And also, you mentioned earlier on the previous position, green is stripped on the midpoint. So even if he were to hit us with a four. He's going to end up with with blots to shoot back at. So it, it's a right move to, 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 to come out. You might be missed or green might hit you and you might have a number of return shots. Um, playing 13 to 5 um, just strips your mid, doesn't it? Brings you down to two checkers um, and you need to get the back checkers moving. I'm surprised that... Um... The other plays are the other wrong plays are still better than the 13 5 because it's um, going to the 18. There's a lot of like 4 1, 6 4, double 3, double 1. Those are all horrible numbers if you go to the 18. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's interesting. But yeah, your rational makes sense. Um, I think what a lot of these top moves have in common is you're you're hoping to get some kind of anchor onto you by going to the 18 or going to the 22. And again, um, green is pretty stripped as well. Um, so hitting is going to result in, in return shots. What do you think, John? Do you agree with this one? Or would you still play 13 to 5, even knowing... Um, <laughs> even knowing uh, X Junior, that, that's that's a bit of a cruel question. <laughs> <laughs> um, even knowing what you said, um, to be frank with you, I think I'd still play thirteen five. It's just like my preferred approach. Um, mm. the, you don't get to be a twelve PR player if you make the right moves all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Position four, again, another tricky one here. Position 167, so white has a double one to play. Green is on the bar. What do you want to do? Um, 
Okay, I love the five point. Um, when I started my backgammon journey, I think that's one of the first lessons I learned how valuable the five point was. Um, when I used to play before, I I would totally discount the five point. I was always trying to make points one, two, and three. I don't know why, but that's just what I thought was best. So I, I fell in love early on with making the five point. Um, so definitely here, I would make the five point with two from the six. Um, what do we do with our last two? This is a this is a bit of a conundrum. I would probably say six four because I can see a bit of a back gain situation here. So I'm not scared of being hit on the three or four point because I'm just going to recycle those checkers. Mm -hmm. And it could possibly help my timing. So if I can't make like a nice pure structure or prime, I'm not going to mess around with anything else. So yeah, six four um, with one checker and six five with two checkers would be my idea of the best play. Okay, so you were half correct, John. Um, so it, it's definitely right to make the five point on stack the six. Um, but with the other two, you should make the other five point because it's just such a powerful upgrade to your position. Having both five points is you, you have the two best points on the board, right? Uh, that, that, that's true. That's true. But you know, you're now six priming those two checkers because your opponent has the 14 point. So... Mm, I don't know. It's got pros and cons. Do you not do you not agree with the back game approach that we don't mind getting some ammunition sent back? Um, not really. Like here, by making um the golden point, your opponent's five point, it, it stops him making it, which makes his spares a little bit redundant, really, because the spares he has on his eight points and on his 11 points he really he wants to use those to make the five point right okay. um, particularly the one on the 11 because it's six away um so by moving up um you you prevent that also i, I like your thinking about bad games recycling the checkers deliberately getting hit but you, you're not down enough in the race you're only 34 pips behind um so you just don't at the moment um but if he rolls a 3-1, that 34 <laughs> could change to 82. <laughs> You're a maverick, John. It's a complete maverick. <laughs> back, back games are like last chance kind of saloon and you, your first port of call for you. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I'll, I'll, I, I'll accept 21-20. As you pointed out, some good positives to that play, so... I will accept that one. I, I heard from a player a long time ago that if you're not making a five point, you need a very good excuse not to, you know, because it, it stops you getting primed, it stops you getting blitzed. It, it's just super strong, right? Wow. And you can see that the next best play is pretty much almost a blunder and anything else. Um, yeah, not so good. Yeah, no, um, fair enough. I'll 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 take that lesson and log it. <laughs> okay, and this is the last one. Um, okay. Two, four, five. I'm, I'm sweating, so I'm glad this is. <laughs> this one. Okay, John, come on. White play five three. White's on the bar, right? Yeah. So the five. Yeah, this is quite easy because the five is an automatic, right? Yeah, sure. So. Um. If we hit on the two point, we don't have a lot of covers to cover it up afterwards. Um, that would be a, a con to playing five two. I'm wondering if maybe six three is correct because obviously leaving the 13 is probably not a good idea. And 2118, 
Well, our opponent doesn't have that many like in the zone there. But mm, all right. Look, I'm not I'm definitely not sure on this one at all. Um I'm gonna put my hats on 20 points and two points, but I'm not sure. So hitting five to two, yeah. Sorry, six six three. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Six three. I, I don't think I want to hit on the two. Six three and uh, uh, bar twenty. Sorry, my bad. Okay. The correct play is the hitting play, John. Um here. Hitting on the front of the prime is is super strong, you know, here. Um, really like powerful role. Um, you've still got quite a lot of work to do here as white. Um, so so hitting there, um what are you giving green? You're not giving him that that many uh returns, any two and and double one, right? Um, so only only, only 12. 12 rolls out of 36. So only a third of a time uh, he hits. But how about our opponent rolls like a 2-3 or a 2-4 and they come in on the two point and then hit us on their five point. And then we fan. And then they make their five point. Now all of a sudden, they've got a pretty <laughs> strong board going on. John! I thought you were an optimist. It was this, this catastrophe. If I, <laughs> if I hit you loose, you've got a stronger home board, right? You've got a four-point board. Uh, I, uh, fan, I fan so easily. Like, it, <laughs> it can be a one-point home board, and I'm odds-on to fan. Honestly, I'm scared of fanning. But, yeah, all right. All right. So, here, yeah, hitting on the front of a prime, taking a measured risk, it is pretty good. And then you've got some good duplication of numbers. You've got fours to cover, twos, threes, and, and so on to, to escape the back checkers. Um, there you go, John. Those were five positions. So uh, did I get four wrong and one? <laughs> <laughs> it's not why you go wrong. It's it's understanding why you got them wrong, you know, and that's, that's part of a backgammon journey we're, we're all on, right? That, that's um, a good point. You're right, Dan. You're we're right. all on that journey. And even top players, you know, you saw they make mistakes, right? Even these great grandmasters, um, they, they don't get every decision correct. Um, and often... You know, they're very humble about it as well. You know, on, on their videos, like Zenik with his vlog, is very transparent with saying, oh, I just messed up his cube decision, which mm -hmm. is uh, refreshing. Tell me a bit more about your game, John. Let's go back to some questions. So would you say you're too cautious as a player or, or too aggressive? What no, I think I'm too aggressive, like, I make some really big plays when they are uncalled for. Mm -hmm. So like in this last example, you know, not hitting on the two is, I don't know, like it's almost me trying to be a bit more cautious because I've been guilty of being too far the other way in the yeah. past. But that's the, that's the nuance of the game understanding when to take the risk and when not to that's as important as anything else really so yeah it's something something to work on i think yeah um it sounds like you're doing some really good work though and you know part of my channel is 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 to help you know i i don't claim to be you know a super strong player um, but I think the backgammon community, we all learn from each other, you know, and, and, and that's important, right? And you are a good player. Remember our recorded <laughs> match and you got like a three point something PR. That's that's good going. I did okay that one, yeah. Um <laughs> but um do you read many backgammon books, John? Or or not so much? Meech's books, Mark Olson's mm. books, no? No, as as I said, I've only got that one book on my shelf and um, I'm only four pages into it. Um so yeah, look, it's not to say in the future I won't become more of a bookworm mm -hmm. um on backgammon, but um uh, at the moment I think I'm more about the practical visual learning that you get from playing and revising positions like these five 
quiz positions you gave me. Um, that's probably my preferred way of going about it, you know? Yeah, sure. So how was it? Let's get back to Monte Carlo. Because yeah, let's, I am, let's I am interested in your I've got, I've got a return flight book tomorrow morning. So take me <laughs> <laughs> I'm slightly uh, envious uh, that you went, but I'm, I'm really glad you had, you had a great time, John. Um, you know, and I think it's testament to the backgammon community that everyone's friends, you know, they, they welcome you when you arrive. It doesn't matter what level you play at, you know, the yeah. fact that you're... Actually, they should have got the red carpet for me because I'm like, <laughs> they're like, oh, here comes a 12 PR player. Let's welcome him. They yeah. really, we want Balance more. it out a little bit. You're like an everyman of the backgammon world, you know, <laughs> um, and I like that. Did you, yeah, did, just... you see, did you see many matches when you were there? Did you watch other people play? No, I I didn't like ZZ's matches were crazy and and mochi, mm. like they had like like a as many people could fit round the table and watch and and uh, well, and Phil's matches I think as well Phil Simberg his his yeah. matches the, they garnered a lot of attention from the other players around. Sure. Um, so yeah. Uh, I didn't watch too much of um, other people's matches because when I wasn't playing, I was just trying to soak in the atmosphere or or just prepare myself for maybe my next match or yeah. So I I didn't want to like just oversaturate myself with backgammon itself. It was more yeah. about the the occasion. Um, how but, did you go about preparing for matches? Um, just trying to ground myself to not go in too overconfident or too too full of trepidation, because it's a scale that works one way or the other. You kind of you know grounding yourself implies like just being middle of the road, just being like. Okay, I'm just going to relax. I'm going to take the decisions which come and treat them as calmly as I can, not get too hit up emotionally or something. And I, I succeeded on that front because even when things went wrong for me in games, um, it, in poker, we'd say tilting, yeah. where you start behaving irrationally because of stuff that's just gone um like against you mm -hmm. and i was able to even when dice rolls didn't go my way um whether good for my opponent or bad for me i was just quite middle of the road about that which is i don't know if you you know people who don't know me personally might not appreciate how big a improvement that is because <laughs> <laughs> well backgammon is, is it reflects life, doesn't it, in some ways. You learn to kind of temper your emotions um, and just be just be cooler, um, not so reactive um, to, to events. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave cooler to the likes of ZZ. He's a very <laughs> cool customer. I'll just use the word karma. <laughs> karma. Amazing. So yeah, do you so think your... your philosophy your outlook of backgammon has changed after monte carlo um yeah i don't know i mean the the revision i'm doing like what i said i was doing with reese and we've covered one match already i'm looking forward to covering my last two matches i would say that's where i feel the improvement will come from yeah, is that revising what I've done to see where I can do better in the future? Um, in terms of the actual experience, uh, I wouldn't say I learned something, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Right. You, you know the the team behind the organizing the the just it it was immaculate. It it was worthy of being the world championship of backgammon. You know, um, there's a few things that I think that Galaxy could tweak as the organizing team. Um, there's a few things I think that 
maybe would help generate more numbers because that's important. We want to grow this game that we love. For we example, want... what what such as what things? Maybe if they shortened the the schedule of the week. Mm -hmm. That would make it easier for people to attend on two fronts. Financially, you know, it's one less day's accommodation. Yeah. It's one less day to take off secular employment or self-employment or whatever. Um, so I think that could benefit um, numbers. Maybe people just don't have that time to commit a whole week to what's essentially a hobby people have got families people have got other commitments you say i, I don't have that problem because I'm, I'm divorced but you say to your wife or your kids right i'm off for a week where are you going well, i'm going to play backgammon in monica they think they think you're going to have a good time which which you are in a backgammon sense but they <laughs> think like you lardy darding and um, <laughs> holiday destination that they wish they could go to as well like you know so I think that would work um the registration fee was 200 out of the thousand euro entry so that works out at 25 percent it's it's a little bit it's a little bit high I would I would say um if they maybe changed it slightly to 150 850 i heard a few other people saying that um it would just maybe represent a little bit better value for the player it would add to the price pool um and that's that's a positive thing um maybe backgammon galaxy if they have confidence in any changes they make going forward Maybe they could stick a guarantee on the event, 100,000 euros guaranteed to the winner, something mm. that's like eye catching that will grab people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, I used to play poker, and uh, Poker Stars was quite a big poker site back in the day, probably still are, but they would have satellites and um, tournaments that would generate entries into bigger more prestigious events um i think galaxy could do that they'd probably have, and, yeah so. yeah i think they'd probably get a lot of interest if they came up with some sort of structure where people for smaller amounts of money could earn their way via qualification and get like entry into this tournament then they only have to worry about um attending it or they put a complete package together where oh, no. the top five people of a league or something get entry and accommodation to the world champ something like that because i think those 207 runners now we there's there's more than enough backgammon players to get that number higher than that so what what's stopping all these other players come? I'm I was thinking there's quite a few UK players who uh, maybe I shouldn't name them, but if if I think they're good players, they'd probably like to play that. Why weren't they there? Mm -hmm. Why weren't some of the notable international players there? Like um, two that come to mind: Neil Kazaros, he wasn't there. Dirk Sherman, he mm -hmm. wasn't there. Like. And there's another guy who posts on the forum a lot, Thomas Tenland. He's also a very good player. Why wasn't he there? Mm. I think if they can find out what's stopping more people from attending, then they could maybe find a key that unlocks it and grows it. Because yeah. even, you know, what's a, they, we talk about a negative spiral where something bad influences something else and it becomes a perpetual negative spiral well the same can happen positively so maybe simply by starting with a bigger guarantee that eye catching and draws people then that brings more people in and then all of a sudden it takes care of itself because you've created more buzz more hype more interest more more accessibility sure I think uh, one thing we can say for sure is it's in good hands. Monte Carlo, the Galaxy team, uh, Mark and 
the whole Galaxy team did did a fantastic job with the suit. And it was their first year of doing it. So yeah, I'm... order and you know, absolutely fantastic matches, stream, the streaming quality, the oh, organization. Yeah. And I think it's going to grow and grow because obviously some people might not have been there because of COVID worries around COVID still. Um, so I think it's it's on an upward trajectory. And... Let's, let's hope so, because it will be so much better for this game we love. Absolutely. So XG, have, have your thoughts changed at all on XG, John? Are you more uh, beloved of XG now after at Monte Carlo and your, your work? Uh, on your well, look, look at like the top eight finishers. They're all playing to a very low PR. Yeah, there, there, there's something in that. Only a fool would deny that. So, yeah, the, X, XG is a very good um, foil to base your game on. But um, I'd like to retain some individuality or Mavericknism. <laughs> <laughs> You'll yeah. always be a renegade, John. A colorful yeah, I mean, character, and we need colorful characters. Uh, in the one one day, if they're streaming my match, I'd love to just start with twenty four sixteen when I roll a five at three. You know, just like <laughs> just <laughs> just leave the commentators like what? <laughs> a ghost, yeah. <laughs> um, I can't explain that. I don't know what he's thinking. Like. Just to mix it up a bit. <laughs> um, John, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here. You... Oh, thank, thanks for having me. It, it felt like the time's just flown, like just talking with you. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy you had a good time and you plan to go back next year. Are you planning on attending? Have I? Um, I, I, I would like to. Yeah, I, I think next year I will. Uh, yeah. Oh, that, 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 I mean, even if I'm just an example to a few people to be like, hey, if John's done it, why shouldn't I? Like, just just go for the experience. It's it's brilliant. Like, Absolutely. And it, it is an experience. It's not about necessarily winning because that's a pressure you can put upon yourself. It's about experiencing it, being there around top players absorbing you know that that as amount. soon as i threw my first dice i'd already won because <laughs> i've made the effort i've got off my backside i've gone to uh, monaco to go chase my dream yeah what's wrong with that that that's winning live a dream absolutely yeah. John, a pleasure honestly um thank you all for watching check out my other videos i've had yeah, check out his other videos. Maybe um, I can learn some more tips and tricks off them. I've picked up, yeah, I've had Mark on, Zenek, loads of people. So uh, they've all brilliant players and they've all kind of... Thanks, thank, thanks for having me on. Uh, I mean, compared to some of your other guests, like, yeah, thanks for having me. I, I'm... You're uh, a worthy guest, John, and it's <laughs> been uh, it's been entertaining, and I enjoy I so. your I commentary so. and your enthusiasm for the game, and you're you're moving in the right direction. And who's to say in another three years, another year, another six months, you could be like super strong player, right? Uh, um, it depends how much uh, hard work one puts in. So if you put in hard work, then you can get places. So it's up to me to put in some effort and commitment, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, John. See you next time. Dan, speak to you soon. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Take care. Goodbye. See you later. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you.